So the Bible presents God as both Savior and provider. As our Savior, He, he rescues us from trouble. He saves us from, from God's wrath. But at the same time, He is also our provider. That means He gives us what we need when we need it. And in this lifelong, lifelong journey toward heaven, I want to ask, what sorts of provision does God give us to make sure that we enter His heavenly presence safely? How many of you here, you are excited about meeting God face to face? Say aloud, Amen. Amen. This is for you. This is for me. This is for us. So please be on your feet. We'll be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you for your word. It is a guide and a lamp for us. We thank you for this epistle. Thank you for this new series. And we're going to have a lot of time studying this book and trying to see things from your perspective. Give us insight. Give us wisdom and understanding as we take a look into these four verses today and allow us to go home strengthened, and encouraged by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please take your seats. So our premier sermon in Second Peter will be called God's All-Inclusive Provision. We're going to do a little bit of a summary of the book and, and find out or get some specific details that pertain to this book. So the author. The writer names himself Simeon Peter, the apostle of the Lord Jesus. So un unmistakably, this is the same Peter who wrote the epistle First Peter. So as we all know, he was one of the twelve disciples of the Lord Jesus, and he was one of the three disciples who were in the in the inner circle of the Lord Jesus. And those guys were the ones who witnessed the Lord's glory in full display at the Mount of Transfiguration. That's found in Matthew chapter 17 and Mark chapter 9. Now, there's a little bit of a controversy in terms of the authorship of this book. For the first 17 years of the church, I mean, 17 centuries of the church, this book was not considered a part of the New Testament. Some of the church fathers, including um, Eusebius and Oregon, Origen, they said that Second Peter is not part of the, of the scripture, of the canon of scripture, meaning it, it does not align with the rest of, of the 65 books that we now know. On the other hand, some church leaders, including Jerome, Methodius, and Firmilian, say that, no, 2 Peter is part of the New Testament. And Athanasius and Augustine, those big names in church history, said that, indeed, 2 Peter was first penned by Peter, and second, it belongs in the New Testament canon. So there, that Peter is the writer, 
and it is indeed a part of the New Testament. So for, for at least 300 years now, it has been unquestionably a part of the New Testament. So we're studying it. Let's talk about the audience. Based on the information we gathered in chapter 3, verse 1, we can say that Peter was writing to the same people he wrote to in his first epistle. It's the same folks. The same believers uh, found or who lived in the five cities that Peter mentioned in chapter 1 of his first epistle. When was this written, though? Let's talk about the date. We cannot give a precise date, not even the year, as to when this book was, was written. But we can, have a, we can have an estimate. It is estimated to be written between 65 and 68 AD, somewhere in that period of time, sometime. And this was written just right before he was martyred. And when we go to later verses, we can see um, Peter saying his goodbyes to his friends. And kind of like, it, it gives you the same vibe as when you're reading 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was Paul's last letter. 2 Peter is Peter's last letter. So why did he write in the first place? What's the occasion? So here's the thing. The church was infiltrated by false teachers, and they became a serious, serious threat to the church because of two things. Number one, they taught false teachings. And number two, they said that sin is okay. And to Peter, who was a witness of the Lord Jesus, he was there when Jesus had his earthly ministry, he said that, no, these guys are lying you should listen to them. And this is what you need to do to equip yourselves against those false teachings. So you, you will notice the big difference between 1 Peter and 2 Peter in the sense that 1 Peter is an encouragement to suffering believers and 2 Peter is an enlightenment to believers to keep them from being deceived. So in this sense... Second Peter is a little bit more action-packed, more exciting than the first, the first book. But both are good. So, what's the purpose of this writing? Peter was writing to a, to a church, to a first-century church, and he is writing as a concerned pastor and theologian. Now, he challenged his readers to do three things. First, that they should grow in their Christian walk. Second, that they guard themselves against false teachers. And third, that they should look forward to the Lord's return. So, as you read this book, keep those three things in mind. So, let's talk about the first two verses. Verses 1 and 2, grace, peace, and knowledge. So as I've mentioned earlier, the writer is, is Peter. Simeon was his old name before Jesus renamed him to Peter. We all know this story, right? But we can see something interesting here in verse 1. He calls himself first a servant, and then second, an apostle. And I find that very interesting, actually. So, by using these two titles, Peter declares that, one, he belongs to Christ. And second, he was commissioned by Christ. As a servant, that was his choice. He decided to serve Jesus. So, he made that choice. But as far as his apostleship, Jesus chose him to become one of the 12 disciples. So the letter is considered a general epistle. That means it is not addressed to a specific person or a congregation. And from what we can gather from, from the internal evidence found in the book, we know that this was at least 
read to five different cities mentioned in the first book. Now, we can see Peter being very sweet, very kind with his words. So he calls his readers to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. This is Peter. Do you remember what, what kind of attitude he showed just on the night before Jesus was, was arrested? He was one of those folks who was trying to, to see for themselves who Jesus thought was the greatest among them. This, this is a Jew. This is a Jewish guy. And to, and to Jewish people, they see themselves as superior. No wonder the world hates them. But here's the thing. Peter is showing us that he equates himself with Gentiles. Th this letter is intended for, for Gentiles to read. Now, The term obtained, we see in, in verse 1, comes from the Greek word that means to receive by divine allotment. So what he, what, he, what he seems to mean is that Peter is writing to, to Gentile believers who had received the same spiritual standing with him and the rest of the apostles and the rest of Jewish Christians. So to him, every single Christian is equal in the sight of God. And then he mentions the word faith. Now the faith mentioned here involves all of the doctrines, all of the teachings that Peter and the rest of the, of the apostles taught the first century church. And then he further explains this faith by saying, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, this is one of the verses. This is the only two verses in the New Testament where we can see that Jesus is referred to as God. So when you look at it, how Peter worded his sentence, he says, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's only one subject in the sentence. Technically speaking, there's this rule called the Granville Sharp Rule. And I don't want to go into the specifics of it. But what Peter is trying to say here is that Jesus is both God and Savior. So he's saying that Jesus is is God, as opposed to a lot of people who claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. That's a topic for another discussion. We're not going to do that today, but we affirm in this church, before I came here, I read the church's statement of faith, and the church affirms the deity of the Lord Jesus. So I said, let's go pack. Let's go there. All right. So, verse 2. Peter prays that his readers might grow in grace, peace, and knowledge. We know grace, it is God's undeserved favor to sinners. And when you receive God's grace, the immediate result of that is those two. First, you, you receive peace with God. And second, you will get the peace of God. Now, this grace also enables the believers to grow in knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus. It, it kind of reminds me of what Jesus said in John chapter 16, that when the, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will remind you of all my words, of all my teachings. It reminds me of Ezekiel, that when God changes our hearts, He will help us obey His laws. So there's a sense of without Grace, without the grace of God, we will be unable to understand who God is, what He does, let alone what the Bible means. So Peter wants his audience to have their hearts guarded by the peace of God. Meaning, the better they know God, 
the more they will experience His grace and peace. That's a lot of information, I know. But I want this passage to be as practical as possible. So here's our first point. A Christian's faith rests in Jesus Christ's person, grace, and mercy. Let's talk a little bit about about ourselves. Our culture places too much emphasis on nationalism and sequence. I mean, we think that we are superior to others simply because we come from a certain country or we are first at something or we are the best at something. That's how the world works. That's how people think. For example, the Jews prided themselves in being God's chosen people. It's no wonder that even to this age, they are still being hated all over the world. The Americans, they pride themselves as the, one, as the first nation to send men on the moon. Filipinos, we pride ourselves in having the best beaches in the world and the best-tasting ta- best mangoes. Your life will never be complete unless you have tasted mangoes from our country. <laughs> we take pride in that. Bananas, too. How about Canadians? What are you, what are you proud of? That's my second one. Yeah? <laughs> we... I, I, I did a research, and, and a researcher said that one of the things that Canadians are proud of is because Justin Bieber is from Canada. <laughs> and I was like, what? If he said Connor McDavid, I would say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I know that Canadians are proud because you guys are the best in the world when it comes to hockey. That's undeniable. No one's going to argue with you guys. I mean, even when the U.S. gets the Stanley Cup, it's mostly Canadians. I know that. (laughs) Right? But here's the thing, my friends. That's how the world thinks. That's how the world works. But that's not how God thinks, and that's not how salvation works. It's not about who's first. It's not about who's the greatest. It's not about who's the fastest or strongest or the best. It's not about that. The Bible says that salvation is not about human achievement. Moreover, the Bible says God plays no favorites. Therefore, there's no such thing as superior and inferior Christians. And Peter got that right when he wrote this letter. We're all saved equally. Not one is more saved than the others. Let's read Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. There you go. God saved us, not because of us, but in spite of us. Quite frankly, God didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to save us. He was fine. He was doing fine in heaven. He, he, he is not a lonely God who needs companionship. Let's get that straight. He doesn't need us. Jesus didn't have to go and carry that cross and allow his body to be nailed on that cross, but he did. Why? To show us the immense and the, the immensity and the abundance of God's grace and mercy. Anyone who receives the gospel is just as saved as Peter and the rest of the apostles. While those guys undoubtedly have prominent names in Christianity and and Jesus promised them great things in heaven. But that doesn't mean 
that their status makes us inferior to them in terms of our salvation. We are just as saved as Peter is. Back there, up there in heaven, we will be equal. We will be brothers. We will be sisters. No one will be greater than the other in terms of salvation. Rewards are a different story. That's a lesson for another day. So my question is is this. Isn't God's fairness and justice an amazing attribute that we should praise Him for every single day? He loves you just as much as He loves me and Peter and Paul and David and Moses. He loves us equally, and I praise Him for that. Verses 3 and 4, power, promises, and provision. Peter then describes the knowledge, this knowledge that comes from Christ. The verse shows how the knowledge of God is multiplied. He says, through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. So the power that makes 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 us understand God and know Him comes from, from Jesus, His His power. God has provided every believer everything they need for life and godliness. Look at the, the sequence. Life first and then godliness. You first have to have life in order for you to live a life of godliness. Simply put, he is saying Christ is the spiritual resource. He is the source of spiritual life, of power, and growth. Isn't that what Jesus says in John chapter 15? That if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask for anything in my name and it will be done for you. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The idea of abiding, of remaining, we can only be found growing and being fruitful if we are connected to Christ. Sever our ties with Christ, we're nothing. So let's talk about the word goodness. You can only find it twice in the New Testament. That said, it is, it is emphasized in this opening part of, of the book. It literally means good worship. It is used to summarize the expected behavior of people when they come to know God. With that in mind, here, here's what happens. So you, you hear the gospel, you understand who God is, and who Jesus is and what He's done, and now you receive that message by repenting of your sins and putting your trust in Jesus. That's how a person is saved. But then again, it doesn't end there. That's only the beginning of our spiritual journey. Because from that point on, there's this expectation that we should be growing. Friends, it is almost seeding time. I know you are all excited. And Kathy did her thing already last week. They started seeding. You don't seed if you don't expect that seed to turn into a sprout, to turn into a plant, and to bear whatever crop it's supposed to bear, right? You can think of salvation in that same thing. Jesus died for us so that he could save us and give us life. But this life needs to grow and bear fruit. Now, the second part of the verse shows the specific way on how this knowledge is made available. Through the knowledge of Christ who called believers. So it is Jesus who called us. Don't, don't be confused. In the Bible, you can see that the Father calls sinners. Jesus calls sinners. 
and the Holy Spirit convicts sinners. That's why I love the last song that we sang today. I was literally praying, Lord, please, at least one more chorus. Guys, come on. The song spoke volumes of the entirety of the message of the Bible. You can summarize the Bible in that song. You can see God at work, His nature, His being three in one. They are co-equal, co-eternal. Not one is greater than the other. In essence. So, did you notice that Peter used male, personal male pronouns? He used he and him and his. And those pronouns refer to one subject. And it's not God the Father. It's Jesus himself. Now, he says that Jesus is the one calling. And this calling is an act by Christ wherein he, he brings people into a, into a personal relationship with him. Just as how Jesus called the disciples when he said, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That's the same exact thing that he is doing to every single one of us. Now, this calling into a personal relationship is for the purpose of his own glory and his own goodness. Now, Paul, Peter says that through Christ's glory and goodness, the salvation delivered through Jesus' death, the Lord has granted, listen carefully, the Lord has granted believers his precious and great promises. Precious and great promises. That's something. Using two superlative adjectives in the Greek is, is a serious matter. He is saying that these promises were public announcements made by Christ. Now these promises refer to the ones, the promises about the kingdom of the Messiah when Jesus comes and establishes his kingdom here on earth. And then when that day comes, take note at what, at what Peter is trying to say that you may become partakers of the divine nature. But I don't think he's saying that we will be little gods in God's kingdom. That's what the Mormons think, and we don't believe that. That's, that's falsehood. But what Peter seems to mean is that we will become partakers of God's nature. That is, the manifestation of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And he will explain that in the next verses when he gives seven qualities that describe a Christian. And that sermon is going to be exciting. Don't miss that. So this participation in, in God's divine nature allows Christians to share in the victory over sin and corruption. Peter basically says, this is what Christ-likeness look like. And it, he will show that in the next verses. Last point for today. A Christian has everything he needs to live for Christ. Let's swerve a little bit and talk about cars. Have you guys heard about the term recall? What's a recall? It's not redial. It's a recall. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a commercial term. According to Google, it is a process of retrieving and replacing defective goods. It is carried out by removing or carried out to remove consumer products that may pose danger to human health or safety. So if it's a danger for us, the manufacturers call for those products to be sent back to them, either for repair or replacement. Do you have any idea as to 
what the biggest recall in history is. I'll give you a clue. It's a car. When you think of lemons, what car, make and model, do you think of? This goes all the way back in the mid-70s. So millennials, you probably don't know this. The Ford Pinto. The Ford Pinto was the greatest or is the greatest recall in history. The company was forced to recall some 1.5 million units between 1971 and 1976 because there was a problem in the fuel tank and the bolts in its rear. So, so they, they, they uh, tested the car and found out that there was not enough reinforcement between the fuel tank and the bolts. So when, when, when the car rolled into the, the Pinto's back or uh, the rear end at a speed of at least 20 miles per hour, what happened was the cars caught fire and in some cases, they even exploded. That's the Pinto. That simple fault in design, in, in manufacturing, caused a lot of damage to the company. And that's a lot of losses for them. But they're still here, so I guess that's a thing of the past already. But what do we get from that? Why did I use that? I don't know. I just want to talk about cars. <laughs> No, thankfully, we don't have to worry about being recalled. So tap your neighbor and say, thank God you're not going to be recalled. <laughs> Here's the thing. Our God is powerful enough to offer something that when he does offer that thing, it is complete and it doesn't need any revision or repair or recall. Our salvation is complete. Not only in the sense of us being forgiven of our sins, but also in how God provides us with everything that we need to live a godly life. In Christ, we find both salvation and provision. In Him, we are complete. He completes us. Therefore, we have every spiritual asset that we need to ensure growth, maturity, and being fruitful. As the Apostle John says in John 1, 16, for from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And that's amazing. Everything you need, everything I need to grow into, the, into a mature, productive Christian is already in us. But God's provision overflows in the natural realm, in our practical day-to-day -day lives. Let's read Psalm 34, 9 to 10. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints, for those who hear Him have no lack. The young lions suffer and want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. God is teaching us today to learn to be happy, satisfied, and content. Because we have everything we need. Jesus, when he left, when he, when he went back to the Father's abode, when he went back to heaven, he did not leave us incomplete. He did not leave us as helpless, hopeless orphans. Because He is our Savior, that means God is our Father. And since God is our Father, He provides our every need. He gives us His grace, He gives us His knowledge, He gives us His, His power and His amazing promises. But here's the thing. Millions of professing believers do not have a first-hand experience of this reality because to them, 
Jesus is nothing but an option. Jesus is nothing but an addition to their already amazing life. If anything, people who are suffering, people who don't have anything to turn to, people who don't have their loved ones or friends and even the government to help them, they are the ones who can appreciate messages like this. In one, in one TV show, Christian TV show, it, it was, this idea was, was presented. Why is Christianity booming in the East and it's dwindling in the West? And somebody said, because the West is progressive. People are rich, they have everything they need, so they think. But in the East, when you think about Asia and Africa, the Philippines, my country, 90% of the population is poor. Like people eat once, if they eat twice a day, that's, that's a celebration. And for the most part, if you have rice and water and salt, you're good. We are so glad we don't have to live like that here. But if we think that we don't need Christ, if we think that Jesus is nothing but an option, or in addition to our already amazing life here on earth, we are gravely mistaken. Take away your earthly possessions. Who are you? Who am I? Take away anything. Take away everything. Who am I? Here's the good news. If we have Christ, we have everything. And he makes sure that you and I are well equipped. We have enough resources. We have help. All we got to do is ask. Ask.